morning and welcome to the CDU Community Forum. Today's special guest is Anissa Muhammad, author and founder of the Sister for Life Health Equity Group and also a CDU alumna. And joining us as usual is David M. Carlisle, President and CEO of Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science. And hosting as always is Sylvia Drew Ivey, Senior Special Assistant to the President and CEO for Community Affairs. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you for having me, Jonathan. Good afternoon, Dr. Carlisle, Dr. Um, Ivey. It's good to see you both. Anissa, thank great you. to see you. Thank you for being with us. Well, thank thanks you so, much so much for the invitation. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Sylvia Drew Ivey, and I'm so happy to be with you again. We've been on hiatus for the summer uh, with, our, um, with our meetings, and uh, we're starting off the year with a bang uh, with uh, a wonderful guest uh, and our own president. Um, a lot has happened over the summer. I'm going to take a minute to sort of... Uh, recoup what's been happening since we were last together. We started off with our amazing uh, commencement um, and we had the largest graduation that we've ever had in our 56 year history. So that's a very big deal. We are very excited about it. We have also recently added uh, a wonderful new Dean of the School of Nursing and we've welcomed uh, a very deeply experienced interim provost to our roster. We also have announced a partnership with the NFL to foster diversity in sports medicine, under which we will send two of our students to complete clinical rotations with the Los Angeles Rams medical staff. How about that? So a lot is going on. But we still have COVID around. We still have COVID, okay? And it's still a major topic, uh, but most of the numbers have been trending in the right direction. Uh, and Dr. Carlisle is going to talk about that. We re remain, as his uh, suggestion, cautiously optimistic here at CDU. Uh, and thanks to him, we continue uh, to issue rapid tests to all campus visitors, including students, staff, and faculty uh, for the time being. So he's keeping us abreast of what the developments are. We're now hearing uh, news of something called monkeypox. Uh, and he encourages us to get informed about this latest virus from reliable sources so we can all do our part to protect ourselves and our communities from this outbreak but he points out that there have been only so far 10,000 infections of mon monkeypox, whereas there have been 93 million infections of COVID. So they're a little bit different in dimension. Now let's get to our discussion today. Uh, our featured panelist is Anissa Michelle Mohammed. She is founders of Sisters for Life Health Equity Group, a nonprofit organization that promotes health and well being for women and families here in South LA. She's an author of Repair the Black Family Anthology, a collection of inspirational real life stories from a range of contributors. There's a link in the chat if you would like to pick up a copy of that. And of course, she is also, we are very proud to say, a CDU alumna of our own school of. Um, uh, College and Science in the Ma Master's in Public Health program. She, she graduated in 2016. She's just a youngster. Uh, she spoke at a recent event at CDU Alumni Affairs in Atlanta, and her speech was so moving uh, that we invited her to come and join us on today's forum. Welcome, Ms. Muhammad. Thanks again, Ms. Ivy, for having me. Thank you. We're so happy to have you. As always, we're joined today by our own president, Dr. David Carlisle. He is our recurring medical expert who has been president and CEO of Charles Drew University since 2011. He's a board certified internal medicine specialist, a published author in health policy, quality of care, medical education diversity, and elimination of health disparities. He served as director of the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development 
in Sacramento for 11 years under three governors, Gray Davis, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and who was the third one? Jerry Brown, Jerry Brown, but eight years under Schwarzenegger. That's a long time. Uh, under his leadership, uh, our, that office re released its first ever health disparities report and increased scholarship and loan repayment opportunities for health providers committed to practice in underserved and under-resourced uh, communities. I invite you to tune in to the State of the University address that Dr. Carlisle will be giving one week from today on August 30th, where you hear much more from him about what is going on that we all need to know about. The theme of the address will be progress and perseverance. We'll put a link in the chat right now so that you can RSVP. Welcome, President Carla. And you in the audience, thank you for taking your time to join us today. I have some questions to get the conversation started with our panelists and we'll take questions uh, at the end. You can ask questions if you have them as you listen in the chat um, or tweet them with the hashtag tag CDU Community Forum. I wanna start with you, Ms. Muhammad. A topic that I know is a priority for you is health literacy. Health literacy is the degree to which individuals have the capacity to obtain to process and to understand basic health information, information that is needed to make appropriate health decisions. Low health literacy is more prevalent among minority populations and those who have low socioeconomic status, making it very relevant to our communities in and around South LA. What brought this topic to your attention, Ms. Mohammed? My pursuit of a, um, my doctoral dissertation or my doctoral manuscript mm -hmm. is rooted in health literacy. Prior to my going into the doctoral program, I had a, a different idea in mind until I started doing research. And I'm sure that um, Dr. Carlisle and yourself are very, and others are familiar with how you start looking or researching one thing and it leads to something entirely different that you didn't expect. That's what a good researcher does. And I learned that there are many people who, whether they are from disenfranchised communities or not, when they go to the doctor's office, more often than not, they don't understand what doctors are telling them. And so it leads to, um, compacted health problems because they don't understand how to take their medication. They're not quite sure what the doctor said about their particular medical condition. And I think that that's very um, crucial and can be proven if you just happen to go to any clinic. This is not, while it is something that affects those with low socioeconomic status, it's not limited to them. Mm -hmm. There are those who are producers and um, with higher levels of education, but a NASA engineer may not understand what his doctor is telling him. So health literacy is a grave concern to me and it is a public health issue because we have to approach patients and explain to them in a language and in a manner that they will understand and they will be more compliant because no one really wants to be ill or burdened with a chronic illness. And they need, if the more information that you give them in a manner that is acceptable to the patient, not the cookie cutter stuff, but the information that that patient, in each patient is different. We can't treat each patient, patient X the same as patient Q because they're two different people, probably even if they have the same medical condition, their level of understanding where they are mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Are they well during the time of your, of your conversation? Everyone that is within earshot of this particular broadcast and Dr. Carlisle, myself and you, we're all patients of someone. Mm -hmm. We go to the doctor too. 
And it, and most doctors still, they, they don't take the time to fully listen to what their patients are saying. This came full circle to me while being employed for Los Angeles County Department of Health Services as a community health worker. And the doctors did the best that they could with what it is that they had the time to do with the patient because they were only a lot of, no more than 15, maybe 20 minutes of time with the patient. But when the community health workers used the training that they were given to be able to do motivational interviewing and having real life conversations and addressing the patient as an individual and not an MRUN, we were able to rebuild a strong rapport with not just the patient, but their caregivers, their families. And we were able to help them to understand what they were to do and their health statuses did improve. They no longer visited, visited the uh, emergency room as if it was their personal doctor's office. They were more compliant with the, taking their medication regimens. And whenever they ran into a problem, more often than not, they called a the community health worker and not their doctor. And I am very proud to say that all of us that were deployed to work in the various hospitals and clinics across Los Angeles County from 2015, even to this present day, I'm proud to say that we have an 80% success rate with wow. our patients. And that's saying something for a group of individuals that do not have MD behind their name. Excellent, excellent. That says a lot, so yeah. Uh, Dr. Carla, what, what role can medical schools play in addressing this issue of health literacy? Well, um, listening to, uh, to, uh, to our, our alum, uh, Dr. Muhammad, uh, uh, speak, um, you know, it, it, it just reminds me of uh, something that we're becoming more and more aware of in terms of healthcare. <clears throat> and, and, and yes, we already know that, that uh, doctor-patient communication is difficult. And yeah, you can be a NASA engineer and that, that communication is difficult. Um, but it can be made um, more difficult when there is this lack of concordance um, uh, between the provider and, and the patient. And the role of CDU, of course, is to um, diminish that um, the degree of discordance that occurs between the patient and the healthcare provider. Um, uh, we know as providers that as soon as you start saying something um, bad to a patient, they can, they, they can lose their, 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 their focus, their retention. And that just gets worse when there's a, when there are issues of communication, trust, confidence between the, the, the patient and the provider. And by, by training more providers from un, under-resourced communities that don't have good access to the healthcare system to start with, we're gonna do something. Um, we're, we're doing something to address this situation. Th this is actually a, a big problem in healthcare. Uh, simply the ability to communicate effectively with patients. Uh, think about it. When you sign a consent form for a procedure, a major procedure, for example, one that where you may not necessarily emerge, um, you want to make sure that that communication is as intact as possible. And that's a, that's a challenge. You can imagine all the barriers that exist out there that can impair that communication. Well, part of our role at CDU is to, to disseminate the recognition of this phenomenon and also to do something about it. Thank you. What do you believe, uh, Ms. Muhammad, are some of the um, uh, responsibilities for health literacy um, that we can ask the patient to uh, take responsibility for? Um, are, are particularly an under-resourced community, what, what, what can we ask them to partner with their providers to, to ensure successful outcome of their collaboration on their health challenges? The, the assurance and insurance that the patient will be able to work better and more effectively with their provider is that it has to be a two-way street. Communication is a two-way street. 
okay. and providing health literacy to a patient or literacy at all. It's a two-way street. Um, I would suggest that, let me, let me back up. I'm going to rephrase. The doctor's relationship with the patient is first and foremost and very, very crucial. An individual will never take responsibility if they are not drawn into the, the, the picture, so to speak, of what they need to take responsibility for. Yes, it is true that patients rely too much on doctors and they don't take responsibility for their own actions. For example, doctors are often telling their patients that they need to change their lifestyle when they know nothing of that patient's lifestyle. They don't know that that patient is living in a household where there's total chaos and confusion. They ask them to go and eat better foods and more healthy foods, but they don't know that there's a food desert where they actually live. Mm -hmm. And pointing that patient or that individual to a food for less is counterproductive because they don't sell the best food. To have a patient under your care doctors for 10, 15, 20 years, and their medical condition is not getting better, but only getting worse in some instances, part of that is on the doctor, part of that is on the patient. So what I would recommend is that the doctors become more fluent and more knowledgeable on what real health literacy is. And it's not just going on to different websites and looking at functional literacy tools because I may be able to, to pronounce the word bladder, B-L-A-D-D-E-R, but I may not know what its function is. I may not know how what I'm doing is connected to the poor bladder function that I have. Does that make sense? And so to be able to draw a picture mentally, to be able to pull that patient into them and treat them like an individual, show more of an interest in that patient and let them know that you care and not how much you know will really, really make an impact, a positive impact on that patient's life. Once they fully understand how to connect the dots between what they're doing, what they're eating, how they think, and their lack of participation in their own health status, once they're able to connect the dots in those things, they will do better. They will do what they need to do. Honesty and trust is very crucial in our community because as it is with all of the internet stuff that's out there and the opinions of family members, behaviors that they don't wanna let go of, um, the fables and false data about cultural foods, it's real interesting that they will use, the patients will use this if they're given the opportunity as an excuse not to change their behavior. Mm -hmm. But we have to be knowledgeable about what these different cultural differences are so that we can address them. We have more in common than we have in, in you know, similarities than we do differences, but we have to really put forth a greater effort on both sides. Patients are very difficult to have to work with sometimes, and they are frustrating, yes, but just think about how frustrating it is for them to try to figure out what you're saying when they will never tell the doctor, they may not tell their nurse that I don't understand a word you're saying, can you please put that in plain language for me? 90% of them are not going to say that. It isn't, isn't the role of the uh, community health worker part of the remedy, an intermediary between the physician and the patient where you can go over some of the things that don't happen in the conversation in the exam room and reinforcing whatever the uh, physician advice is on what the patient should then do. Do we need to really expect the physician to do all of that in a 15 minute visit? Oh, of course not, no. Doctors are doctors. And they have their own set of rules that they have to go by. But doctors are not miracle workers. 
A doctor cannot handhold a patient and keep them from going into McDonald's, Burger King, and all the other fast food restaurants that our communities love so much. Community health workers are absolutely an answer, but they're not the only answer. The challenge that we face is that there is no, um, say, set criteria or university or school or certificated program that will educate community health workers on how to become community health workers. Nor is there, it's no longer um, a need in the healthcare industry for them. However, they are being utilized in a great way under the, the spearhead of social services inside of healthcare agencies. Does that make sense? Every hospital and clinic have a social service program of some sort, but the community health workers are now being used to work and help in social services, but not the health aspect of what it is that they can do. For example, when I worked as a community health worker, we did home visits. Patients would call us if they had a question or a comment. And we left, I left, I can't speak for others, but I left my line open till about 8 p.m. every single day, except Sunday for my patients in the event that they came and they had some sort of medical problem or medical issue. We went to the hospitals to visit them if they were in the emergency room, if they were hospitalized, it was our job to go in and investigate to find out what actually happened with that patient. And so that presence and that trust, sometimes we were there more than their own family members. And they loved us for that. They really began to trust us for that. They protected us when we came into their homes and their communities. They, re they really protected us. And some of those communities are pretty rough to go in, but they and protected this, and, and us. And was this under a funded program or? Yes, it, it, was, it started as a, a pilot program that was spearheaded and designed by Dr. Mark Gotti, who is now the human health and human um, services point person for Governor um, Newsom. And it was... It was his baby, so to speak, in, in, a, in a large way. And it was, yeah, he, he was. He helped to foster and put that program together. He, Dr. Clemens Hong, and actually Dr. Mitchell Katz, who is now in New York. They worked together to make sure that this pilot program got funding. So that, and I, if I'm not mistaken, it was 28 of us that started in the beginning and then they started training the um, work and um, work, W-E-R-K organization began to train more and more community health workers. So now you have community health workers in the clinics, but they're under the social services auspices. You have community health workers also working in um, the Ment um, Department of Mental Health. So there, we are very, very crucial. We play a pivotal role. And, and may help in patients to become better. But our best job and the best job that we could possibly do is to help patients in the clinic with their medical needs and not social service needs. That's well, just my opinion though. Well, Dr. Carlisle, can you, can you comment on the, on the difficulty, the, the positive quality of what is being described as a, a help, helper in the system and the concerns from a medical standpoint that patients may then be asking uh, community health workers questions that they're not trained to answer. Can you talk about that difficulty? Um, well, yes, and I, I, I think uh, Anissa Muhammad is, is, is bringing up uh, something that's, that's, that's very, very crucial here. Um, and it's, it's, it's that, that quality of communication between provider, and I'm, I'm going to say providers with an S. I'm including community health workers, um, and and the patient, and community health workers have a um, have a role that is still being being defined and even embraced in the healthcare system, uh, that is a, a highly effective one, which is basically kind of amplifying um, and, and modulating um, communications from 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 other other healthcare providers. 
and 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 doing so in a way that <clears throat> um, can make those communications um, even more relevant to the context of the individual in ways as as Anisa mentioned that the, that the doctors may be entirely oblivious to, but a community health worker who sees an individual in their um, you know their personal environment on in a regular basis not only can can speak within that environment can understand how that environment can impact the information that the individual, the patient is receiving from their, their traditional healthcare provider. Um, th this is actually a, a crucial function. And, and I, I'm, I'm just so, so happy that we're discussing this um, because it really speaks to a special role of community health workers in improving communications. I, I, I've never come across a situation where I, I've been concerned about the quality of that 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 conversation or the content of it, it's always been just the opposite. I've I've always been been grateful that we've had the community health workers there um, to help um, uh, individuals, um, patients, um, uh, better understand and receive medical information because it can be so confusing and overwhelming sometimes. And then you throw in the whole trust issue, and it becomes more just way more complex. And community health workers can can address all these these issues uh, uh, very very directly and very effectively. Uh, we're in a, a great place because of community health workers. Well, I I don't think there there's any disagreement, uh, especially someone like you who's training people for service in in um, South LA and underserviced communities. But if this is such a good idea, why isn't this funded? Uh, at the national level so that this is a workforce that's available, particularly in communities such as ours, where we need this kind of supportive um, ancillary um, part of the delivery system that ensures trust and communication and continuity. It's not funded well by the federal government. Um, and I, my surmise is that they don't trust people who don't have an MD, PhD to, uh, to communicate on health matters. Am I wrong in that assumption? In one sense, yeah, you are. Okay. And I'm saying that because we didn't just go and fill out an application and hit the ground running with community health um, as a community health worker. We were extensively trained, thoroughly trained, professionally trained, tested and tried by a group of some of the most awesome doctors that I have ever seen. Dr. Heidi Befarouge, Dr. Clemens Hong, and we underwent grueling training before we were ever deployed and we got hired. It's not in, in, in a great sense, the work that we do with our patients is not rocket science. This is, we have the rudimentary understanding, comprehension, and tested and tried on the anatomy and physiology of the body systems that are affected with diabetes and high blood pressure, just as two of the major um, chronic illnesses in our communities. We were taught what the body parts are, what they did, how these particular organ systems are affected by um, their disease processes. We were taught what the doctor's job is, the medications that the patients will have to take, how to research those medications, and how to apply what our job description was as community health workers and how to talk with the patient and the doctor communicate, be that liaison. We didn't do it on our own. We were in constant communication with that patient's doctor well, on a well, daily well, and weekly well, basis. What was the program? What was the program? It was a program set up by actually the Workforce Empowerment. I forgot what the acronym stands for, but W-E-R-K. Their office is in the, um, the, 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 the Union building down on downtown on Wilshire and Union. There's, it's a training center, and it was a um, community health worker training certification program. I'm not sure if it's still active, but it was active in 2015, 2014 when we got trained. Do you know whether the funding was federal or state or local? 
I know that it was state at first, and then um, Ms. Diane Factor, that's, that's, the, that's the lady's name that ran the program. She was able, she and um, Mark Ridley Thomas were actually able to sit at the federal table to get more funding for that program so that they can continue to train and work with community health workers. What happened after that, as far as community health workers being accepted for what they did in the healthcare services and PCMH or primary care medical homes, I'm not sure what happened. But if you wanna know, one of the things that could be done is advocacy work. Healthcare professionals, those that are administrators of healthcare facilities advocate with the politicians and the, and, and the leaders of the districts that your hospitals and your clinics sit in advocate to make sure that community health workers remain on board in clinics. Okay, As doctors, can... talk about, bring these things up, the National, the American Medical Association, the National American Association, the National Nurses Association, these particular professional organizations can be very helpful on the advocacy end if they understood the dynamic and the impact, the great impact that community health workers have. We do have our own, say, groups, but they're not as powerful politically as the um, National Medical Association or the American Medical Association. But community health workers do have tremendous value. Oh, there's no question of value. The question is um, whether it's been institutionalized. And it sounds like there's been leadership um, here in California, but I don't know whether it's national. In some places, Boston, for example, they were they set the precedence. So University of Chicago, Illinois, um, they did a they have a wonderful program where they talk about community health workers and their help in making sure that the um, Hispanic community were able to improve their health status with those that had type two diabetes. They use community health workers on the ground. And that is the precedence of that, of that entire study. And they even have a national program where colleges, universities, individual organizations uh, can come under their license to use what they use as research and action steps to make that reality um, real for the patients to improve type two diabetes in their lives. Well, that's, that's all tremendous uh, advance in, in uh, making that available. And, and please look in the chat for more information uh, on these programs. People in the audience are listening and, and putting in information about that. Um, Dr. Carlisle, the, the COVID pandemic has, is fraught with misinformation resulting in portions of the population believing uh, they were literate on the subject when in fact they weren't. How can we address fostering health literacy in an age of rapid disinformation campaigns and the sowing of general mistrust in our system for political gain? Yes, and um, you know your, your, your last statement uh, speaks to intentionality, uh, which has, has certainly been part of uh, part of this issue as well. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that. Uh, uh, that that this is a situation that is 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 not going to improve over time. I, I'm sure that we're going to be in a, a better place uh, tomorrow than we are today in terms of understanding of COVID-19. Um, and I, I think this is just an example of um, the communication uh, issue that exists within healthcare, and and how it's important to be able to to represent um, the priorities of all the communities uh, that we serve. Um, and um, because those priorities can, can be different. I mean, every community is, is different as every individual is different. And, um, and, and, and policy makers uh, really need to be fluent in the nuances of all the different um, communities um, that policymakers serve. Uh, when policymakers lose that, that fluency, when they lose that connectedness, that's when policies kind of get derailed. And I think that's what we saw with, with COVID-19. Um, uh, our our, our COVID-19 policymakers um, seem to not be able to be able to um, communicate effectively with all the communities that were uh, were necessary to be communicated with, especially communities that were that are 
under under resourced and and may not be um, may be uh, entirely directly involved in the healthcare system uh, where where trust is an issue. Uh, this this is just an example again of where we need to to continue to work in this area. And uh, you know you were asking earlier, Sylvia, about the community health workers and funding. I, I would just say, um, you know, status quo is not the future. And if we want to change the future, uh, then we need to work on changing the status quo. And it can be a it can be a, a lengthy process, but it's actually actually how healthcare works in general. Um, healthcare is is constantly being it's constantly changing, and I hope constantly being improved with some backsliding here and there. Um, but um, but but this is an example of how we can make progress. Um, if you asked me 20 years ago um, about community health workers, um, I would know much less about them than I do today. And um, in the future, I will know much more. And I will um, aspire to having them be every bit a part of the healthcare team, just like a pharmacist or a social worker is. And I think that's where we can go, but we need to you know, keep working on that. And COVID-19 is just another example um, COVID-19, uh, the pandemic is constantly changing, constantly reshaping itself, constantly mutating. And that, that dynamic nature of things adds to um, <clears throat> just kind of uh, fuels uncertainty. And where you see uncertainty, a, a very conservative defense mechanism, it's just kind of um, protection. You know, you, you don't want to embrace new information um, if it seems um, if you have other information that's there as well. Well, it's very hard, isn't it, Dr. Carlock, to stay up to date uh, uh, on what is happening even with COVID, with all of the emphasis on COVID. We haven't even gotten to monkeypox yet, but um, now we're hearing that there are going to be uh, new vaccinations that we should be getting in the fall, but we don't know when, and we don't know how long the current vaccinations that most of us have tried to get will be effective. It's, it's kind of fast moving for the lay audience to stay informed and proactive, isn't it? Oh, it, it totally is. And <clears throat> excuse me, just uh, re remember uh, COVID-19 is a, a condition that, that, that essentially didn't exist three years ago. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of people are used to uh, constancy in their healthcare environments. Um, uh, this is just the opposite. This is uh, instability. And where you see instability, um, uh, it's natural to see, um, see uh, uh, distrust because that's a, that's a defense mechanism in the face of um, instability and, and new information. I, I, I'm not surprised by where we are. I think we've made um, really good progress. There's a lot of better progress made to be sure. But I think that over time, we're actually making progress. Um, uh, new technology is, is part of healthcare. And um, uh, with new vaccines, just like with all healthcare technology that's new, it, we require um, the healthcare system to ensure that uh, those new technologies are, um, are distributed with equity and, um, and justice in mind, because that's part of the healthcare system. And I'll just add, despite what the, uh, the Wall Street Journal has recently said from its editorial board, we're we're now focusing. Uh, let me let me stay with you for a moment on on a new thing that we have to learn all about, and that's monkeypox. Uh, what mistakes, if any, do you see being made in the current response to monkeypox that could hamper health literacy on this topic? Well, I think that's a that's a really really good question. Um, you know, I'll, I'll share from my own personal perspective. Um, you know, I, I probably, you know, within my own family kind of contributed to this. I got a, I got a, a message from one of our family members. Um, uh, hey, Dave, uh, what's this monkeypox thing? Very, very early on when it was starting to be a blip in the in media. And I said, oh, you know, it's a very rare condition. Uh, no, 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 no big thing. Nothing to worry about. Um, and the reason I mentioned that is it's kind of a metaphor for how the healthcare system responded. If you, if you take that response of mine, and multiply it by a few thousand people, what you see is inertia. Um, what you see is, is a, a lack of um, 
recognition, once again, just like with COVID-19, that something can explode in a very incendiary fashion um, and, and elude our ability to keep up with it. And that's what happened with, um, with monkeypox. Um, the healthcare system was looking at it through um, old lenses, an old context, a status quo context, which was accurate at the time, maybe. Not realizing that the status quo can change literally overnight into something very different um, that transcends that, that old context. And, and this is a lesson for us, especially in public health, but in all of healthcare. And that lesson is things change in healthcare. Nothing stays the same. And our healthcare system has to be, be willing to embrace the change um, because the change is the future and the status quo is the past. And just when you think something is a status quo, um, it's actually something that is already in the past. Ms. Muhammad, what, what are you sharing with community uh, members about um, the fact that we seem to have returned to normal vis-a-vis -vis COVID? We're, we're going to restaurants, we're going to large events. Uh, do you think it's too soon or what are your concerns about whether we should stay in our pre-COVID mindset uh, and stay in our homes, or should we go out in the world? What, what is the community saying to you, and, and how are you dealing with those questions? When I get questions about what should be done with regard to COVID, I tell them to be careful because Based on past experiences, just in the state of California and Florida and other places, as soon as the venues open, then the surge comes back up. There were always, always, always increases in new incidents of COVID and people being reinfected with COVID. And so we have to go beyond what we are told as far as, well, it's safe to go because it's, you know, the, the hospital admissions have, for COVID have gone down, they have decreased. That's really, really good. And it is a good thing. But we also have to remember that it's still out there and we have to be careful. We still, I was still wearing masks. I haven't been vaccinated and I don't plan to be vaccinated. I still wear my mask. I still wear gloves, especially now, even with, um, with monkeypox, since they can be transmitted from um, uh, and be and live on inanimate objects, I wear gloves in stores. I wipe down everything, no matter where I go. And we have to still take those precautions because COVID is still out there. Monkeypox, which is something new, and they're really just now getting into. Um, even though they do have a vaccine out here, so to speak. We're not hearing anything about how effective that vaccine is right now. We're not. So, and until and unless the numbers start speaking to us, we should proceed with caution. And as it relates specifically to the COVID vaccine, we're still getting millions of reports in the vaccine adverse event reporting system that the CDC has. As of July the 29th, there has been 1,371,471 reports of adverse events regarding the COVID vaccine just by itself. And so that is telling me that there are people that are getting the vaccine and having adverse effects from it, which also goes into the fact that COVID still exists and we cannot deny it. Until I get a report heard on the news or a big party and parade in the street with confetti and noisemakers and things saying COVID no longer exists, I'm going to still proceed with caution. And I suggest the same thing for others. Dr. Carlisle, I know you, you uh, uh, are advising uh, the university that COVID is still around and uh, that we should get vaccinations when the new um, shots come out in the fall. What, what is your opinion about these adverse uh, effects that Ms. Muhammad is sharing today? 
Yeah, I, I, th I think the information that Anissa Muhammad just provided um, is is uh, is very important. It's critical. It, it, it's part of this this whole context of um, introducing a new medical technology like the mRNA um, vaccines against COVID-19. Um, you know, this this is the type of feedback that's important. Um, I've not I've not looked at these reports myself at all. I, I I've actually seen uh, very little discussion of them, which is interesting. In, in the media, um, uh, and um, you know, to the, to the extent that there are all these reports, um, yeah, I, I I think that what uh, what uh, Anissa Muhammad says is 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 concerning and, and compelling, and, um, and and needs to be examined and and looked at um, and looked at. Uh, so, but but this is all part of of how we how we develop and introduce um, new technologies. I'm just I'm glad that we have this. <clears throat> this um, reporting system for um, uh, for vaccine side effects. And uh, Dr. Like Carlisle, mm -hmm. if I may um, be so bold, Dr. Ivy, I think one of the things that hindered um, the type of information that our communities received is that when COVID first became a pandemic overseas and then came here, the only thing that the media and the public health organizations, World Health Organization, the CDC and others, they only focused on the deaths. And even though one life, one life being lost to COVID was tragic, but they should have put a lot of also emphasis in reporting the truth with regard to 90 to 98% of the time of the persons that acquired COVID-19 recovered. Maybe not completely because of the long haulers and the long hauler syndrome, but when I did the math, which I learned how to do at Drew, by the way, <laughs> when I did the math, it was usually 1.2 to 1.4% of the population that, it, that was a, fatal, a fatality from COVID but it was 98% of the people who were infected with um, COVID that actually recovered. And if the, the, the public health agencies and the media had focused more on how many people actually survived, it may have changed the trajectory of the mindset of the people and how they reacted to maybe um, being introduced to other treatment therapies that are available for COVID as opposed to outright rejecting because all they did was focus on the number of people are dying and you know these people died, these people died. They never talked about how many people lived and survived. You're looking at a survivor, somebody that actually had COVID and lived to tell about it. And you're, you know, you're, you're I, I, I totally agree. I think um, we're, we're, we're actually um, subject to this media filter in our society. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'll often disagree with a lot of material that's in social media, but social media has presented another alternative to the traditional media vehicles. Um, for, for better or worse, it's, it's a, a, another mechanism for people to acquire information. Um, and I, I've never researched the question. I can't tell you whether most of the social media information about COVID-19 is good or is it bad. But it's another source of information. And I think that the more information people receive, especially from sources that they trust, uh, the more informed they can be in making decisions. But this is also a special role of healthcare providers and just coming full circle. It's a role of community health workers um, to, to be there to be a, um, of assistance to people when they have questions. You have a question about a vaccine. Uh, it's pretty hard to pick up the phone and call call a doctor and say, hey, what's up with this? Um, but maybe with a community health worker in your community, it's easier to find somebody who knows something about the subject matter that you can actually talk to in an effective way, and I'll emphasize effective way. Um, so so this, this, is, this is part of why communication is so important in healthcare. Yes. And I, I'm glad that we're in an environment where, where, there's, where there's more information because there's so many information environments that are out there where there is less information. And I'd prefer to be where we are than in one of those environments. Ms. Muhammad, can I, can I switch a minute and uh, 
ask you to tell us a little bit about your book that you authored with contributions from several sources. Tell us about Repair of the Black Family Anthology. What, what is that about? Repair of the Black Family Anthology was the brainchild of a sister that I know in St. Petersburg, Florida. Her name is Nayara Muhammad, and she has an organization called Repair the Black Family. She asked for volunteers and 33 of us responded to help her put together a book to help repair our community. This work is not a book for us, it's a mission. And what this book is basically about, it's about 33 different people who never actually met in person face to face before, but we build a camaraderie over distances. You have an author that's from authors from Mexico, from Puerto Rico, from the Caribbean, from the United States. And we all got together to talk about what the traumatic things that happened in our lives personally and how those traumatic events evolved into self-sabotaging ways and behaviors that hindered us from being our true selves. And what is our true self? I am a dynamic individual and I was born with an aim and a purpose to do something great. We believe everyone has that same purpose. And so we all got together. We talked about the trauma that we affected and what we did to actually come out of it to where we're full functioning and thriving adults. And we have action steps at the end of each chapter where we talk about this is what I did to help myself. Because somebody somewhere in this world is going through the exact same thing that the 33 of us have gone through and live to tell it. My chapter is chapter 21 and it's called Mining the Mind. Meaning that I had to, I overcame and have lived through domestic violence, drug addiction, um, abduction and torture. And I talk about that in my chapter. And I had to take a look at myself to find out how did my life get so out of control and what I and the steps that I had to do to heal myself. And I don't want to divulge too much because I want everybody to buy the book. The link is in the chat. But that's what the book is about. We believe that healing the Black family is to heal humanity. There are a lot of people out there that are survivors and victims of domestic violence that are stuck because they can't get through it and can't get past it. I want them to know that they can. There are some of us that have gone through torture and some horrible, horrible things, but it's, and it's okay. You can get the help that you need through mental health services, um, making scrapbooks, journaling, do what you have to do, but know that there are people out here that have been through the same thing you have been through and we can help you through it. I hope you get the book, Repair the Black Family. And, and you also are, are part of a group called Sisters for Life Health Equity Group. Can you tell us a little about that before we Yes, yes, ma'am. Um, Sisters for Life Health Equity Group came into existence in 2017 um, and it's something that is rooted in some, some words that my mother shared with me and my sisters, that no matter what happens, y'all sisters for life. And she told us that when we were growing up, she always told us that. And so I wanted to use this as a vehicle to promote a more progressive methodology for health and wellness for the people of my community, for individuals and families mentally, physically, and spiritually so that they can, so that we can curtail the onset of preventative illnesses, diabetes, high blood pressure, um, and different um, chronic illnesses. To me, those are actually medical diagnosis for social and behavioral problems, with an exception of those that were actually born with, um, with type 1 diabetes. But more often than not, one thing spirals into another because of what we've been conditioned to think, what we have grown up with in our environments, eating 
sugar laden foods and different things like that and thinking because our great grandmothers ate this that it's okay for me to eat it today we have to understand that what great grandma ate back then is not the same thing we're eating today and we have to understand it's a different dynamic everything is different and we have to take charge of our health my primary reason for changing the dynamic or the niche of my agency is because I'm very concerned about our children and our young people in that you have more children and in, in our youth between the ages of 10 and 25 that already have been diagnosed with type two diabetes and some of it is out of control. To know that and to watch and to see a eight year old boy on life support because his mother did not know he was diabetic was heart wrenching for me. And there are more children out there that are diabetic and their parents don't even know it because they're not actually testing children for diabetes that young. And if we don't do something to get in front of this phenomenon, by the time these young people in those age groups are 30 and 40 years old, they're going to have diabetes so out of control that they're gonna have their limbs amputate. And I think that it's a shame that in society, that amputation is now being geared toward being a form of treatment. And to me, there's something wrong with that picture. So I'm hoping that Sisters for Life will be able to provide health elevation education to women with families and to individuals in our community to help them to manage their illnesses and their disease processes more effectively because it is preventable and it's manageable. They just have to be coached into doing it. Dr. Carla, thank you, Ms. Muhammad. You're you, I'll give you the last word for our, our session. This is, this is a, an example of what education in public health helps <laughs> underlay. Uh, tell us about the, um, the work of the College of Science and Health. People know generally about uh, the medical school and the nursing school, but as we hear from Ms. Muhammad today, I think the, the audience needs to hear more about our College of Health uh, Science. Can you mention that and, and tell us how, how we happen to be lucky enough to draw this one young woman to our, to our shores? <laughs> Well, well, thank you. I, I, I think you actually said it as, as, as well as it can be said, uh, Sylvia, and I just want to say how um, how proud I am of our um, alumnus, uh, Anissa Muhammad, for, um, for her stellar leadership in this arena. You know, this is, this is why we have a public health program in our College of Science and Health. It's to, um, it, it, it operates at the intersection between uh, community and the healthcare system. And in fact, you know, I'll, I'll just quote a Yellow County healthcare officer that I knew many years ago when he said, um, public health is not part of, not part of medicine. Medicine is part of public health. It is. Um, you know, if, if, we, if we prioritize public health, uh, we won't have to prioritize acute care medicine as much. Um, lives are, are literally at stake here, just like you mentioned that 10-year-old that, that um, in the ICU with, with diabetes when nobody knew that they had diabetes. Um, this, is, this is actually um, where public health can make a big difference and prevent somebody like that from having to be admitted to the hospital because their diabetes was detected at an earlier point and can save all that pain, suffering, and unfortunately, you know, very, very adverse outcomes. So I just want to say how, how proud I am of Anissa Muhammad that she's a, a graduate of our program. And I look forward to, uh, uh, to working with her in the future. And I would just say, that everyone in our audience should take uh, what she has said to heart and, um, and read those books as well. Thank you, Dr. Carlisle. Thank you, Ms. Muhammad. This Thank you really all good. so much. I'm so proud to be a CDU um, lion. I really am. Thank you all mm -hmm. so much. Stay tuned, everyone, for our next session. Thank you for being here today. Uh, we will keep these wonderful conversations going. Uh, you see how much we learn when we reach out to people who are doing the work in the community that we had hoped they would do once they left CDU. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Have a good evening. You too. Good night. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you so much. Take care. Good to see you, Anisa. It's good to see you too, Dr. Carlisle.